Gotta love Star Wars. Star Wars, first episode of Star Wars came out in 1977. Looks pretty cheesy by today's uh, digitally enhanced sci-fi standards, doesn't it? But back then, it was cutting edge. Uh, and, and after Lucasfilm finished filming this first episode of Star Wars, the brown cloak that you see Obi-Wan Kenobi wearing right there was stored away in a warehouse and forgotten about. That is until it was rediscovered 10 years later, and on March 6, 2007, the famous cloak was put up for auction, and an anonymous bidder took it home for a mere $104,000 for that cloak. Can you believe that? So a cloak, also known as a mantle, usually had a hood, came all the way down to your ankles, designed to protect the wearer from the elements. And uh, this would often be the only outer garment a traveler would take with him. So it was worn as a coat by the day, and it transformed into a blanket at night for sleeping. And over time, the cloak became a symbol of power and authority, which is why we see it worn by so many protagonists in movies like Star Wars and Robin Hood and The Hobbit and Chronicles of Narnia. And it's also why comic superheroes like Superman and Batman wear capes, which are just simply modified forms of cloaks. Good guys and bad guys wear cloaks. The uh, Passion of the Christ movie, the guy that plays Satan, wore a cloak. Remember that? So they're all over the place. Just before Jesus ascended into heaven, he told his disciples in Luke chapter 24, verse 49, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed or cloaked with power from on high. And, of course, the promise he's talking about is the coming of the Holy Spirit, which would act like a cloak around his, the disciples to provide all the resources they will need in their lives once Jesus leaves them and ascends back into heaven. And so the title of this last message in our Holy Spirit series is called The Holy Mantle. Remember we had just M names? Holy cloak sounded cheesy and holy mantle sounded much better. Anyways, and so today we're going to learn what it means to be clothed or cloaked by the holy mantle by looking at first the seal of the spirit, which is about security and insurance, assurance for the life to come, and the sign of the spirit, which is the power and authority for our lives right now. So for, let's first look at the seal of the spirit. Ephesians chapter 1. Verses 3 through 13 is our text. And as I, as I read through this, notice how many incredible, awesome things that we get because of our faith in Yeshua, our faith in Jesus, because it's just incredible. Notice the timing of when we get these things, and notice who decides who gets these things, okay? So... Let's just, let's just read through it. It'll be up here on the screen. You can follow along with me. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Messiah Jesus, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Messiah. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Messiah Jesus in accordance with his pleasure and will. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he freely given us in the one he loves. In him, in Yeshua, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under the Messiah. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were first to put our hope in the Messiah might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And then the next two verses Verses 13 and 14 really focus in on this sign of the, the seal of the Spirit. It says, when you believed, you were marked in the Messiah with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. 
You know, in, in, in ancient times, in biblical times, kings would use a personalized signet ring as an official signature stamp on important documents, like instructions to be delivered to generals on the battlefield or like treaties or trade agreements to de be delivered to kings in other lands. And there's a picture of it. So you would take a little drop of wax, you'd heat it up, you'd drop it onto the document, then you would take your ring and you would impress it into the wax and your signet would be um, impressed there. And so um, another way it was used was to securely fasten letters like this one right here. So not only would you know that the doc document is, is legit, you know who it's coming from, but you also knew that it wasn't tampered or altered anyway, which is really important in communication back then. And so a seal like this indicated four things. Number one, authenticity. You could be certain that it was the real deal. Number two, ownership. You could be certain that who it belonged to. Number three, worth. You knew that it was important, had great value. Number four, Authority, you knew that the promises made were 100% guaranteed. You could be assured. And so that simply all adds up to a whole lot of security and assurance for the person receiving the document on the other end. So back to our text in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. Um, when we choose to believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, God marks our hearts with his own personal signature, which in this case is the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, who then is a deposit that guarantees our eternal future until the day when God chooses to come and redeem us once and for all. Now, one of the books in the Hebrew Bible in the Old Testament is called Shir HaShirim. In English, it translates to the Song of Songs, and it's also known as the Song of Solomon. And it's basically a steamy, romantic love story between King Solomon and a future bride known only as the Shulamite woman. They are absolutely crazy in love with each other. And throughout the entire book, they often express their love in no uncertain, often very steamy language. In chapter uh, 8, for instance, verse 6 and 7, the woman says to Solomon, this is what she says, she says, Set me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm, for love is strong as death. It's jealousy unyielding as the grave. It burns like blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Many waters cannot quench love. Rivers cannot wash it away. Ooh, la, 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 la. I am hoping that Andrea will whisper that in my ear <laughs> later on today. Guys, I don't suggest you whisper some of the things Solomon said about her. They were culturally relevant back then. But, you know, when you tell a woman that her thighs are like the colonnades of, you know, that's probably not good. But she wanted Solomon to know that she had chosen him, that she was hopelessly in love with him. And that her radical and unquenchable love for him is a sealed deal. And this is intended to be an incredible picture of the crazy kind of radical and unquenchable love that God has for each of us. In love, as we read earlier in Ephesians, in love God chose us. He predestined us to be his children. When? Before the foundations of the world. Can you get your mind around that? It's hard. God was crazy in love with me and you before he ever created us. And I don't get it, but I like it. Because it means that God's love for me is not based on what I do or I don't do, but simply on who I am. Because he chose to love me long before I ever did anything good or bad. I like that. And now, since he chose me, once I choose to love him in return by believing in Yeshua as the Messiah, he sets his seal. He takes his signature ring and he puts his Holy Spirit right there upon our hearts. And his love for us is so unquench unquenchable, unquenchable, I got that right, and so irrevocable that this seal acts like a security deposit guaranteeing that we will be with him forever. 
It's got authenticity. We can be certain it's from God himself. It's got ownership. We know that we belong to God. It's got worth. We know we are of great value to God. It's got authority. We know that God's promises to us are 100% guaranteed. In other words, the holy mantle has us covered on this one. Now, whenever I read this passage in Ephesians, I always get questions from a few people who would ask this. Well, does God choose us or do we choose God? Does our faith hinge on God's predestination or on our free will? To which I always say, yes. Let me explain how this has worked in my own life, okay? Long before God created the universe, or me, long before time began, God launched what I imagine a beacon, kind of a, a line or a light or something, out from eternity past where he was at, that would travel across time, across all of history, into eternity future. That beacon is called predestination, and it contains God's predetermined will, as we read in Ephesians 1, to give me every spiritual blessing that heaven has to offer, to make me holy and blameless in his sight, to adopt me as one of his kids, and to forgive my sins through his shed blood. And according to Ephesians 1, this all took place before time began and according to God's predetermined will. But then, nine months before May 1st, 1952, I was conceived by Morris and Barbara Binder. I don't think anyone forced them to conceive me. I believe it was done of their own free will. It was probably on one hot and steamy August night in Los Angeles, California, maybe a cocktail or two. The mood was right. You know how it goes. If you don't, ask your parents later on tonight. <laughs> but nine months later, on May 1st, 1952, I was born in the quarantine ward of Los Angeles General Hospital because my mother had the measles for the last three months of her pregnancy. That's not a good thing to have. Probably explains a lot about me, doesn't it? <laughs> Nine years later, in 1961, I don't believe anyone forced me to fool around and pretend I stole a banana at the local Baskin and Robbins ice cream store down the street from my house and then smashed my head into a pole while being chased by one of their employees and ended up getting a half a dozen stitches and a two-inch scar that you still see in my forehead today. I think I did that all on my own. Thirteen years later, on April 28, 1974, no one had to force me to marry a cutie pie named Andy Lee Brooks in a Jewish wedding under a chuppah in the Sportsman's Lodge in Sherman Oaks, California. That was just a no-brainer. Five years later, in November 1979, I don't believe anyone forced us to move to a brand-new, beautiful home in Irvine, California, just a couple of months after our second child, Michael, was born. And finally, in 1983, I don't believe anyone forced this very skeptical Jew to walk into a church service for the first time where I had a very surprising spiritual experience that caused me to investigate whether or not Jesus was truly the promised Jewish Messiah. Eight months later, I became convinced that he was, and that is when my free will intersected with God's predetermined will for me, and when that intersection took place, I received everything that God had preordained for me before the beginning of time. And I also received his personal seal on my heart as a deposit guaranteeing my eternal future with him until the time he comes to redeem my life once and for all. And so those, um, or whose will was it? Was it God's will or was it my will? The answer remains yes. Yes. By the way, I've, I've never shared what I'm going to share right now in public before. Well, I've shared it twice now this morning. But um, I've never shared this in public before, but it seems really appropriate given the subject matter. Sometime during that eight months of investigating 
I became convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. It was towards the end of that eight months, and I would have described myself back then as crossing over that line that I was a believer. I am following Jesus. I believe he's the Messiah. I'm saved. But I never vocalized it in any way. I never said the, you know, proverbial sinner's prayer, so to speak. And so one Sunday toward the end of those eight months, I had to stay home from church that day because I was sick. And um, I plopped myself on the couch. Andrew went to church with the kids. And I flipped on the TV and been to flip channels. And I ended up on one of those Christian televangelist programs. And I've got I've to tell you, Back then, I really despised those kinds of programs, and honestly, I despise most of them today because not all, but most of the televangelists are nothing more than money-making shysters or they're freaky-looking, freaky-talking preachers with weird Jesus interviews and weird clothing, and, uh, which is why I'll probably never make it on TV. All right, the weird clothing part, maybe. But even so, there I was that Sunday morning, glued to a really freaky-looking, freaky-talking preacher named Dr. O.L. Jaggers and the Golden Altar of Incense. (laughs) Yeah, that's him right there. Yeah. (laughs) He used to preach standing in front of uh, this man-made contraption that they called the golden altar of incense, which he believed had magical powers. So not only was this guy off the charts weird looking, but he was also off the charts weird theologically. And I distinctly remember, I mean, it's just like clear as day. I remember verbally mocking him out loud as I lay there by myself on the couch that morning, shouting out to my television set things like, you are a freak. Oh, my God, that's not true. Go back to the pit where you came from. Things like that. You got the picture? I haven't changed much, have I? (laughs) Well, but then we came to the end of the program. And while I was still mocking Dr. Jaggers, he began to say, if you've never asked Jesus into your heart Why not do it right now by repeating this short prayer after me? And all of a sudden, my mocking stopped cold. Tears began to stream down my face, and I found myself repeating that prayer out loud that fateful day, Sunday morning. Doesn't God have a sense of humor? (laughs) Who would have thought? That's a true story, but you're all sworn to secrecy, okay? I just don't share that. It's like I'm trusting you with this. When we choose to believe that Jesus is the promised Messiah, our will intersects with God's will, and God stamps his personal seal of the Holy Spirit on our hearts, which acts as a security deposit guaranteeing our eternal future. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21 says it this way. It is God who establishes us with you in the Messiah and has anointed us and who has also put his seal and on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So that is the seal of the spirit, which is about assurance and security in the life to come. Now let's look at the sign of the spirit, which is about authority and power in our lives right now. Acts chapter 1, verses 4, 5, and verse 8 says this. It says, while Jesus was eating with his disciples, he gave them this command. And the context is he's been crucified. He, he rose from the dead. He spends the next 40 days hanging out with his disciples. He's getting ready to, to ascend back into heaven. He says, do not leave Jerusalem. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So, you know, back in ancient times, it was typical for a Jewish son to apprentice in his father's business and eventually take on the same trade. I actually did that. I actually worked in my father's business for 12 years before I met the Lord and doing what I, I, I do now. But this is why, this, this, 
this strong theme for a Jewish son to apprentice in his father's business is why, even though it's, not, it's never mentioned in the Bible that Jesus was a carpenter, most of us will say that Jesus was a carpenter. It's not there. But it's presumed to be there because it's believed that until the age of 30, Jesus worked as a carpenter with his stepfather Joseph as well because that was embedded in the Jewish culture. By the way, do you know how we know Jesus is Jewish? There is a litmus test here to be able to tell Jesus is Jewish. Number one, he lived at home until he was 30. <laughs> number two, he worked in his father's business. And number three, his mother thought he was God. That's why. <laughs> so that's really for my mom. My mom watches these, so hi, mom. My mom actually knows I'm not God, so... But, you know, in truth, we do know for sure that Jesus worked for his real father. Speaking of God the Father, Jesus said in John 5, 17, My father is always at work to this very day, and I, too, am working. And so the idea of working for our father is a strong Jewish theme in the Bible. And since through faith we all become adopted as God's kids, the strong Jewish theme of working for our father passes on to all of us as well. You may not have known it when you signed up for this, but you are now part of the family business. And so in Acts chapter 1, Jesus is preparing his disciples for his heavenly departure. And knowing that he is passing on the responsibility to do the Father's work, that they are going to do the Father's work now, he tells them, don't do anything. And don't go anywhere until you receive the promised gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, they already believed in Jesus. They've already been baptized. They've already been immersed in the mikvah waters of the Jordan River by John. It's not John the Baptist. He's John the Baptizer. John was not a Baptist. There were no Baptists back then. He was John the Immerser. But now Jesus tells them that in a few days, you will be baptized or immersed, not with water this time, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now remember, Jesus said it this way in Luke 24, 49, which we read just a little while ago. He says, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed or cloaked with power from on high. You see, doing the work of the Father takes supernatural resources, and they will need both authority and power from the holy mantle, from the Holy Spirit, to do the kind of work that God will give them. Of course, we know that the promise Jesus is speaking of here is fulfilled just 10 days later on the Feast of Shavuot, also known as Pentecost, as recorded in Acts chapter 2, while they're waiting in that upper room for what Jesus said to hang around and wait for that promise to show up. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost which is Shavuot, when the day of Shavuot came, not the day before, not the day after, but on that day, they were all together in one place. We know there's about 120 of them in that room. And suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues or other languages as the Spirit enabled them. And thousands of Jewish pilgrims would have been in Jerusalem during this time because Shavuot is one of the three feasts that Jewish men were commanded by God to make the trek to the Jerusalem temple. Many of these Jewish pilgrims spoke foreign languages, and they were amazed to hear that some of the people in that upper room were speaking out loud in the languages of their native tongue. But others began to mock the whole Meshugana event, and they said, no! Nah, Ah, these guys are drunk. They have been drinking wine, too much wine. But Peter stands up with the 11 apostles, and he addresses this skeptical yet very curious Jewish crowd, and he says to them in verse 14, he says, Fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully. Let me, I'm going to tell you what's going on here. These men are not drunk, as you think. I mean, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. 
liquor stores in Jerusalem don't open till 10. So, but this is what is spoken, what was spoken by the prophet Joel in the last days. God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. And after sharing with them a little more about how Jesus fulfills the Hebrew scriptures concerning the Messiah, this Jewish crowd is blown away. And they say to Peter, what must we do? And Peter says to them in verse 38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Yeshua for the forgiveness of your sins, and then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In other words, first we receive the seal of the Holy Spirit through faith, which is about the security and assurance of the life to come. And then we will receive the sign of the Holy Spirit, which is about the authority and the power we need to work in the family business. The seal of the Spirit is a one-time experience that lasts forever. But the sign of the Spirit is something that needs to be experienced on a daily basis as the Holy Spirit fills us up, as we do what it takes to be filled up by the Holy Spirit with whatever supernatural authority and power we will need to accomplish whatever our Heavenly Dad wants us to do that day. Are you catching that a little bit? Did you know you signed up for that, by the way? Now, there's a great story in 2 Kings chapter 2. It's about an interaction that takes place between Eliyahu, that's the Jewish prophet that we call Elijah, his real Hebrew name is Eliyahu, and Elisha, that's how you would pronounce Elijah, Elisha, his apprentice. Eliyahu wore a cloak. I imagine it was a really cool-looking cloak. I tried to find one this week, but I couldn't find a cool one. So I spared you the weird dress and the weird hairdo. So, But Eliyahu wore a cloak, a mantle, and just before God was about to take him away, Eliyahu does something very supernatural with his cloak in front of Elisha. Eliyahu takes off his cloak. He rolls it up tight, and then he takes it and he strikes the water of the Jordan River with his rolled up cloak, and the waters split into two so that Eliyahu and Elisha are able to walk across on dry land. Pretty amazing trick, I would say. Once they get to the other side, Eliyahu turns to Elisha and says, you've got to kind of catch the drama here. They've just walked through the parted water. I mean, the Jordan has to stop flowing. The waters have to part. They walk all the way to the other side. I don't know what side they're on. I, you know, if they're on Israel's side and they walk over to Jordan, they're on Jordan, they walk over to Israel, but they walk across. And it's like Eliyahu says, hey, is there anything I could do for you <laughs> before I take off? And I imagine Elisha's eyes are like wide open and he's like, his jaw is down to his knees and he says, yeah. I'd like a double portion of that. I'd like a double portion of the spirit that's in you. Soon after Eliyahu is taken away by God, he left his mantle behind. And Elisha takes up Eliyahu's mantle. And from that point on, Elisha does some pretty amazing things for God. The story is where we get the phrase, take up your mantle or pass on the mantle. It's basically the passing of authority and power from one person to another. And of course, it is a powerful foreshadow of how Jesus passes on his authority and his power to us through the Holy Mantle. He said, unless I go away, the Holy Spirit will not come. And this is the reason why we need the Holy Spirit to come, because we will need the same kind of power and the same kind of authority Jesus had if we are to do the same kind of things that Jesus did 
In fact, didn't he say we would do even greater things? I don't know about you, but that's how I want to live my life. With the sign on my heart guaranteeing my eternal future or the seal and the sign of the Spirit in my life manifesting itself in supernatural ways as I go about my daily life interacting with people, blessing people, helping people, praying for people, working in the family business. We're all called to that. So on the third Sunday of each month, we have our prayer team available. And uh, they'll be standing up front and in the back. And I'll be down here as well. And, you know, there's one, one situation in Acts where the disciples come across these believers. And they said, hey, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, well, <laughs> we didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. It's kind of an awkward passage. You know, it tweaks everyone's theology. It's like, what do you do with that? They believed they didn't have the Spirit. And so they laid hands and they prayed for them. And then there was these manifestations of the Spirit that kind of showed that they're on the right track. And so if you have trusted in the Lord, but you're not seeing a whole lot of power and authority in your life, or 